Okay, um, thank you for that introduction, Kaylee, earlier. Um, as she's already mentioned, my name is Liz Chart. I'm currently a PhD student in the um, Spanish department here in London at UCL. Um, <coughs> and I'm here today to talk to you all about a really beautiful, wonderful, and fascinating um, manuscript that's actually on display here at the front. So if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to wander over at some point and have a look. Um, it's here in the middle next to the lovely hat in the box. Um, and the manuscript I'm talking about is named the Derrotero General del Mar del Sur, um, which we would translate as a, I guess, a general wagoner of the South Sea. Um, this manuscript has a fascinating and very compelling backstory, which I'm going to be talking a bit about today. Um, and I'm also going to mention briefly how it's tied into my own research um, as a PhD student. Um, I work on the historical geography of Patagonia, um, which is how I came to be interested in this really fascinating piece. Um, the the Dedo Dedo stretches um, from Mexico all the way down to the Straits of Magellan and Tierra del Fuego in its cartography. So it's been really influential and important for my own research. Um, so I'll start off by just going a bit into the background of this piece, what we do know about it, what we don't, um, before contextualising it um, as, um, as a piece of cartography in its kind of general Spanish canon. And also I'll end by offering some reflections on the afterlives it's had, um, particularly in the sphere of English cartography. Oh, oh that's the point, sorry. I thought that was a clicker. Um, <laughs> So, the Derrotero was acquired by the society at some point in the 19th century. Um, we don't know where it came from. It may have come from Spain, um, but uh, we don't have any kind of solid evidence um, to link it to anywhere in particular, apart from its place of production. Um, this is a manuscript atlas. It contains 147 charts um, that would have been drawn by hand and likely produced by a workshop. Um, it's noteworthy that the place of production, one of the things that we do know about this mysterious piece, is um, Panama. It, Panama was not a significant site of um, artistic production um, in the colonial period in Latin America, um, or necessarily a cartographic production of, of this particular kind of style, um, although its position at the kind of juncture of North and, North and South America, and as a place that was incredibly transitory, that lots of goods, peoples and ships would have been passing through, most likely, most likely facilitated the access to the large number of pieces of cartography that would have needed to have been consulted to produce such a, a piece that covers such a large area of space. Um, no cartographer or artist is named um, on the frontispiece of this manuscript. Um, we only have the date and the location. Um, the dedication is to the Virgin Mary, which as pious as it is, unfortunately, in, in the contemporary era, doesn't tell us very much about who, who was commissioning it. Um, so these 147 charts depict the Pacific coastline of the Americas um, from Baja California and Mexico um, all the way down to Cape Horn um, in present-day Chile and covers a distance of over 20,000 kilometers, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of images um, from, this, from this piece. So we start in Baja California, we move down to Acapulco in Mexico, obviously a really important and significant port in the Spanish Americas at this time, um, particularly in, um, key to the Manila galleon trade, because this is where they would have been leaving from. Um, we move on to Guatemala, which has some really incredible representations of erupting volcanoes. Um, Panama City, which obviously is another important page in this book, as it would have been where, it was, where, the, where the atlas was produced. Um, Lima, obviously another really important Spanish port, um, 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 shown here is the Ciudad de los Reyes, the city of the kings, and its main and its port um, arm of Callao. Chiloé in Chile, um, which is, was another important Spanish stronghold in terms of the defense of the Straits of Magellan. And then finally we finish up in the Straits and in Tierra del Fuego. So, We can see that this is both a, a beautiful and a significant item in terms of its scope and also its decor. And some of the details that I've highlighted on this page here um, show you exactly how elaborate this piece really is. We have examples of silver leaf application. You probably can't 
quite make it out um, from this image on the right hand side here, but these houses are actually metallic, they're rendered in silver leaf. Um, there are applications of gold leaf as well in the manuscript. Um, and as um, Peter Barber has already pointed out in his research on this piece, um, the intricacy of the ship that we have shown here um, and the, the level of detail and accuracy shows that whoever would have been um, drawing these aspects in the Dead of Toro had um, a, a quite an accurate and a thorough knowledge of these kinds of vessels, which isn't necessarily the kind of knowledge you'd expect an, an artist or a cartographer necessarily to have had. Um, there are a number of really fascinating techniques that we can pinpoint in this in, this, in the Dead of Toro, and this is not least shown in the impressive watercolour um, rendering of the relief, which hopefully you might have noticed in the images I just shown you. I've just shown you, um, but the calligraphy as well, of, as well, is also really impressive and beautiful. Um, you can see an example of that with this lovely face on the on the left hand side here. Um, it's clear that this piece was very skillfully executed and had a large amount of money invested um, in its production. So, what is a dedo dedo? What exactly are we talking about here? The Spanish translation of the word derrotero alone is a, is a root or a course, um, and in English, in the cartographic sphere, this is often rendered as um, either a rutter, which is a term that emerged um, from French cartography for books that would have contained coastal profiles used for navigation, um, or as a wagoner, which is named after the Dutch cartographer of the same name, who pioneered a new kind of cartographic format based on pilot books that incorporated maritime charts as well as sailing directions. Um, Spanish derroteros are quite ubiquitous, and many of them would have been made for travel to the Americas and Spain, for travel within the Americas <coughs> along coastlines, or from the Americas to the Philippines in particular. Um, we can find numerous examples of these, um, which kind of facilitate our understanding of the piece that we have here in the society um, as a unique and special example of this format of cartography. And I'm now going to draw some comparisons with some other Spanish derroteros and the piece that we have here in front of us today to show just how special it really is. So this image you can see here is an example from a derrotero that's found at the um, Real Academia de la Historia in Madrid. And I've, I've put this up because I want to demonstrate that derroteros were often functional documents. They were very much intended for practical use by navigators. Um, and consequently, a lot of them have additional notes, um, annotations, or sections added to them, which can make dating them quite difficult at times. Um, Spanish ones, as well, in the Rutter style, often feature a lot of text because these would have been sailing directions. So, these pieces provide a really fascinating insight into navigational practices in this period of the 17th century in um, colonial Latin America. Um, but as you can see here in this example, the style is much more naive than the images that I've shown you and the piece that we have here on the table. This is another image from the same, um, from the same level dero, and as you can see here, the typical of a rutter format, the coastal views are provided um, with notes alongside them for the navigator. Um, so above all, this is a practical item. It's not really intended for decoration, and the way that the notes have kind of been squeezed in at different angles um, show you how it very much would have been a working document in this period. So I've, I've put up here another example, which um, is housed at the Museo Naval in Madrid. Um, this is actually a very interesting and further unusual object. Is it's actually an 18th century copy of a 17th century derrotero, <coughs> potentially the one that I've just shown you from the Real Academia, which speaks to the kind of complex and interesting circulations of these kinds of pieces. Um, it's filled with notes as well, um, and it also includes various pieces of documentation rendered in different hands. Um, it's a real working navigational document. And the Dero Tero format then is certainly an easily locatable and important one, as we can see in these various kinds of examples. And as you can now hopefully see, the piece that we have here in the society is heads and shoulders above the, many of the other functional derrotero documents um, that we that we can identify in the Spanish kind of cartographic canon, um, mainly in terms of style and, com and composition. But we can see that the derrotero house here is very well constructed, linear, and quite clearly and neatly planned out. There's a lot of thought that's gone into this piece, and it's very much a commission rather than a practical working document. So. 
now that we know a little bit more about the kind of context of production and the um, formats of these sorts of cartographic items, um, I highlighted earlier many of the things that we don't know about this, this really fascinating item. And so I'm going to turn now to what we do actually know and what I have been able to find out in my own research on this piece. Um, which actually is tangential to my PhD, but it's such a fascinating item, I just can't leave it alone. Um, it does keep me up at night. Um, so it's almost like we have a game of cartographic Cluedo on our hands. We've got the location, we've got the date, uh, but we have no culprit. So I've been searching the Dero Dero for clues, um, and I pinpointed a couple of things that I started off with um, that I thought was significant. So I started off by looking into this um, image of the crown that we have on the frontispiece. Unfortunately, that didn't get me anywhere, but if we do have any experts on Spanish heraldry in the room, please find me afterwards. Um, <laughs> so I then decided to look into the, a couple of other items after the crown. The crown saga went on for a while, and I didn't get anywhere. So I decided to look in the potential connection to the Order of Malta, which has been highlighted by Peter Barber in his research on this piece. Um, some of the names that we do have mentioned in the text, although there's no cartographer, on several pages we do have um, names of individuals based in this region mentioned, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, and also the copies of this piece, because although as wonderful as it is, it's not actually the only um, existing copy of this item, there is another one. So the Maltese crosses that we have popping up in the in the Dero Dero, they there are two of them in the in the manuscript, and they appear at fairly random locations. I did investigate, and I couldn't find. These are not significant places. The first one's in in Guatemala. The second one's in Panama. I couldn't make any connection with the location in which these two symbols appear. So. With no patron or cartographer to investigate, I decided to look into the names that do pop up in the atlas. Um, there are a couple shown in what is now El Salvador, um, giving the location of local shipbuilders, which obviously would have been very useful were you uh, a navigator. Um, and I also looked into this one that you can see up here, which is the location of um, a horse farm owned by one Luis Delgado de Rojas. And this is very, preliminary research at this stage, but I have found evidence of a Luis Delgado de Rojas um, through the Spanish archive database. Um, unfortunately, I, can't, I haven't seen the actual um, manuscript that it refers to, but there was a Luis Delgado de Rojas um, who was a, associated with the Order, the order of Malta, um, who was a cavalry leader, which may explain, explain the horse connection, um, who was um, primarily based in Cartagena de Indias, which is now in Colombia, which is located very close to Panama City and would have very much been in constant and important, especially military and naval contact um, in the 17th century. So there's a potential reinforcement there of the connection to the Order of Malta, potentially with the production of this piece. Um, another connection that we do potentially have with the Order of Malta is the president governors of Tierra Firme, which is the province that would have included Panama in the 17th century. Um, two of them that you can see um, listed here, Juan Perez de Guzmán y Gonzaga and um, Agustín de Bracamonte, who were both in power around the time of the Atlas's production in 1669, were also, were also members of the Order of Malta. So this, again, potentially indicates um, the connection of the production of this piece with the order, particularly as it would have been quite heavily financed. So, moving on to the copies. Um, we have one exact um, copy of this piece that's housed at the Huntington Library in the USA. Um, and I think part of what makes this such a fascinating manuscript is this very turbulent afterlife that it's kind of, that it's kind of had. And this copy that's at the Huntington was always thought to have been the one that was stolen by English pirate Henry Morgan in 1671 during the siege of Panama. Um, and the Huntington copy is dated the same year as the one we have here. It's also, it was also made in 1669, but interestingly it appears to have been made in a different hand, um, which points to a kind of workshop format of production most likely. So since the, since the rediscovery, I guess, of this manuscript that we have here, um, we don't know exactly for certain where this one originated from, but whichever was the, sto the stolen copy, we can, we can definitively say that one of the copies of this piece was definitely still in the Americas after 1671. Um, 
I've located another fairly naive um, derrotero in the Museo Naval in Madrid um, that includes material that's copied from the derrotero that we have here, among other items. And most notably, um, all of the text that's in the, that in the original derrotero has been copied. You obviously can't read it, but this section at the bottom here is directly copied from the Acapulco page that I showed you earlier on. Um, and as you can see, once again, this is very much a functional working document that would have been used in, in navigation in the Americas. And the author um, of this text actually notes that this copy was being made in Lima in 1675 um, with materials provided by a range of mariners, some of them stolen. Um, so <laughs> I don't know, I don't think that this would have been one of the stolen pieces, but I, I'd love to know what he was actually working with. So we have also a further copy that was pre that's been brought to light that was made in 1697, so considerably later um, than the 1669 production date of the original Derrotero. And this one's actually held in a private collection, but most notably, it's also it was also produced in Panama. So this points to the potential existence of um, a workshop that was that was still producing into the 1690s. Um, it's incredibly close in style, it's actually a larger format, it's a larger, um, it's a larger piece than the one that we have here, um, but notably all of the text, as far as I've been able to discern, because this is a very incomplete piece, I think we only have about 20 charts um, compared to 147 here, um, it does seem to be an exact copy, but again it's rendered in a third hand, which points to the very interesting and wonderful circulations and reproductions of this, of this item. So. I mentioned the Henry Morgan theft earlier, and this, um, the arrival of this manuscript in England obviously led to a number of copies, um, although the, another theft of a different Spanish Guerrero in 1681 by English pirate Bartholomew Sharp <laughs> off the coast of South America also led to copies being made of what we believe to be a similar document, notably by um, English cartographer William Hack. So we don't know exactly which Guerrero Sharp's crew stole um, but it definitely looks to have been some kind of variant of the piece that we have here in the society. Um, so we can see that the Derrotero has certainly had a really fascinating, quite mesmerising afterlife. Um, and its contents, however, they required quite dramatically altered um, English knowledge of Spanish possessions on the Pacific coast of the Americas. Um, as you can see from the Acapulco page here um, of the English um, copy that was made by Hack from what, whichever document was stolen by Bartholomew Sharp. And this influence on English cartography, as we can see in this next example, actually endured. And this is a map made by um, famed English cartographer Herman Moll in 1711 of the South Sea Company's trading limits in the Americas. And some of you might, some of you with very keen vision, might have picked up on this, the style that we have represented in these smaller scale charts here on the, on the top of the map. Um, <coughs> These appear to have been copied um, either from, most likely from the hack wagoners, and um, this speaks to just how important this information was when it arrived in England, the fact that it's still being copied decades later, particularly in the regions um, in the south of what is now Chile, where um, cartographic information was incredibly scant during this period. Um, you can see here the, the comparison of the Chiloé um, page from the Derrotero and also the Chiloé map from Hack's um, larger map of the South Sea Company's trading limits. You can note that, that the, um, the forms of the land masses are incredibly similar. So clearly there was a, a dearth of cartographic information about this region that was still um, being filled at this period which, and the English in particular were incredibly keen for knowledge of this region because Spain essentially had a significant monopoly on access to the Pacific at this point. So. Um, stealing an item like this was <laughs> incredibly dramatic and had a very important influence on um, diplomacy and cartography in the Americas. So, just a couple of final thoughts to round off. Um, the Society appears to have the best copy of this Derrotero that I, that I have been able to, um, to see. Um, it does appear to be superior to the Huntington version, although I've only been able to see a very um, poor microfilm of their copy, but you can certainly see in the kinds of shading that we have in the Huntington copy that this one appears to be rendered in a superior and more refined hand. Um, 
It's a really important and a unique resource for understanding cartographic practices and Hispanic knowledge of the Pacific in the 17th century. And it's also been a really interesting resource for me for learning about Patagonia. Um, it actually told me that I was looking to see if there was any new information about Patagonia in the Derrotero as it appears in a kind of gap in um, Spanish navigation to that region and cartography. And unfortunately, there's nothing new in there, but um, it's, it's useful as a touchstone for a reference to that late 17th century knowledge of that region. Um, and it evidences the really significant and enduring influence of um, Hispanic cartography and English map making in particular. Um, and I'm really grateful to the society for letting me come and look at this piece on several occasions because it's really wonderful. So do please have a look um, at some point today. Thank you very much.